In this lesson, we're going to take a look at the major developments or steps that took place in developing modern atomic theory. We've got to go from John Dalton, who said atoms are the smallest things, all the way to the nuclear model that we have today. So let's get started with John Dalton. He did his work in the early 1800s, and it didn't change for a couple hundred years. And he put forth the following hypotheses about atoms and matter in general. He said, first thing, matter is composed of exceedingly small particles called atoms. And an actual chunk of this material contains just an inconceivably huge amount of atoms. Not only are atoms there, but they're really, 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 really small. They're the smallest things that exist. In fact, he was a little bit wrong about this, we're going to see, but he said atoms are as small as we can go. They're the smallest things ever. And now we kind of say atoms are the smallest particles uh, of an element or the smallest piece of an element, or the smallest particles that take, um, that change in chemical reactions. We're going to see exactly how the atom is put together later. Now, Dalton also said elements consist of only one type of atom. That's why an element is pure. Everything in it is exactly the same. Uh, these elements, these atoms of an element are identical. And if we're going to have a different element, it's because it's got different atoms. So atoms of one element are unique from atoms of a different element. Compounds consist of atoms of two or more elements. So if we're going to create something we, that's not an element, we can do it by bonding different atoms together. Uh, but when they bond, they always combine in small whole number ratios, which means you can't bond half an atom. There's no such thing as half an atom. Uh, the ratio is the same throughout a given compound. What this means is if you take water, which is H2O, uh, every single molecule, every little piece of this compound has this ratio, two hydrogens to one oxygen. You're never going to find something that has a ratio uh, of like three hydrogens to an oxygen. That would be different. So the same, same ratio throughout the compound. Also, when changes happen, when chemical changes happen, atoms are not created or destroyed. Instead, they break apart and rearrange and combine to form different substances. So these are laws that you guys are probably mostly familiar with. Um, this is the law of conservation of matter. Matter can't be created or destroyed. Um, this is a law of definite proportions, and we'll come back to that later. And we know that atoms of different elements are different. However, we do know that this is a little bit wrong. Not all atoms of an element are identical but that's getting ahead of ourselves. First, we actually have to figure out that atoms are not the smallest particles that there are. So this didn't happen until the late 1800s, early 1900s. And a guy named J.J. Thompson uh, was experimenting with a cathode ray tube. Now, this is a picture of a cathode ray tube, a cartoon of one. Uh, this tube is mostly empty. So all the gas is mostly pulled out of there. And there's a metal cathode and anode. And essentially what these things do is we put very, very high voltage on them and it accelerates particles from the cathode through the anode. And then that beam of accelerated particles is moving pretty quick. That's called the cathode ray. Shoots through this evacuated tube and then there's a screen over here that glows when these particles hit it. So Thompson was doing experiments with this cathode ray tube and he found some interesting things, things that didn't quite jive with Dalton's atomic theory. Um, there are particles smaller than atoms. So in his cathode ray tube experiment, he would change what the cathode was and what the anode was, because these are the pieces that are actually generating the particles. And he found that when he changed those pieces, nothing mattered. It didn't have any effect. So that beam of particles that was produced was the same for any cathode or anode combination he used. And that beam could be deflected by both magnetic fields or charged plates. So this is the straight line path it should have. But if we, if we apply an external field from a magnetic uh, field or an external electric field, we can get that to deflect, which is kind of fun. Um, in fact, old school TVs called cathode ray tubes, CRT, they use these to draw pictures on the screen. Um, and of course, now we use LCD and plasma, so we don't have that issue. But uh, there used to be just uh, this controller here was actually pushing that beam around to light up the different pieces of the screen to draw the pictures. Okay. So he changes the metal and it has no effect. Uh, and the beam is deflected by charge, which means there's something that's in this metal that is common to all metals, common to all matter, uh, and so it's smaller than the atom because it can be accelerated and brought out of the atom, uh, and it's fundamental to all of them. So we have this negatively charged piece, and we know it's negative because it's accelerated away from the negative 
towards the positive and because of the way it interacts with these magnetic fields or electric fields. And this thing is really, 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 really small. Okay? Millikan actually did this. Robert Millikan did what's called the oil drop experiment in 1909, and he found its charge. And since Thomson had done the work to find its charge to mass ratio, essentially what Thomson measured was how much magnetic or magnetic or electric field it took to deflect this thing, which allowed him using some pretty high-powered math to calculate its charge to mass ratio. Uh, he allowed Millikan to do the math to figure out how much mass it actually had. Millikan, in his cool oil drop experiment, found the charge and that allowed him to calculate the mass. And it's really, 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 really small. It's about 2,000 times smaller than the simplest atom, a hydrogen atom. So this little particle is actually in the atom. It has a negative charge, which of course must mean there's a positive charge in the atom too, because we can separate it, which led Thompson to propose the plum pudding model. Uh, and he proposed this in 1904. He said, look, uh, we have these electrons that are scattered throughout a positive substrate, much like there are um, these little chunks of fruit in this pudding, uh, English dessert. Gross, looks nasty to me. Uh, anyways, he wasn't the only one to propose that there would be an arrangement of positive and negatives. Uh, this, this model was put, for, put forth in 1903 that the electrons are like rings around a positively charged body like Saturn has rings. Um, it took another experiment to actually figure out, well, who's right? What's going on? So Rutherford came along uh, and did the gold foil experiment. Actually, he had his grad students and people he was working with do the experiment, but hey, he gets credit for it. So Rutherford actually did a lot of work with Thompson in his earlier days, and he did a lot of work with radioactive particles. And he knew he could generate alpha particles uh, with radium, and he put it in a lead box so he could focus this beam and send them all more or less the same direction. And what he did is he had his, his helpers uh, shoot these at gold foil. This piece of gold foil is not thick like a piece of aluminum foil. It was pounded very, 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 very thin, a uh, couple hundred atoms thick maybe, and they shot alpha particles at it. And what happened was a little bit surprising. The alpha particles went through, mostly. Okay? So most of the alpha particles went through, hit this detector on the other side, more or less undeflected. A few of them were deflected a little bit. But then a surprising thing happened. Some of them were shot straight back or almost straight back. Not very many, but it did happen. So how is Rutherford going to explain this? Why did most things go straight through, but some things come back? So what Rutherford proposed was that atoms are mostly empty space. That's why most of these alpha particles could pass through it pretty much without being phased. Since this was a very thin sheet of foil, there wasn't very many atoms to get in the way. The atoms are mostly empty space, so we can shoot right through them. However, alpha particles are small, uh, but they are mass. They do have mass, so they are occasionally going to hit something. And alpha particles have a positive charge. They have a plus two charge, we know. Uh, and so occasionally they would get close to one of these little atomic centers and they would be deflected away from it because like charges repel. Occasionally they would actually hit fairly straight on with one of those and be bounced more or less straight back. Uh, and so by explaining this with this dense tiny nucleus that has the positive charge with the mostly empty space around it, we have a good explanation of why most alpha particles go straight through but a few bounce straight back. Rutherford called that dense tiny center uh, the nucleus, which means a little nut, and it's the massive positive center of an atom. And we know that's where the protons are, and we know that's where the neutrons are. Neutrons were exceptionally hard to find. They were not found until 1932 by James Chadwick. Um, but we do know now that in the center of every atom is a nucleus. That nucleus contains protons and neutrons, and around the nucleus we have the electrons. The nucleus is oh, a thousand times or a hundred thousand times smaller than the rest of the atom. So to put that in perspective, if we had a football field, then the nucleus would be a marble at the center. So the nucleus is very, very small, but that's where almost all the mass is. It's where all the positive charges and the electrons kind of flit around on the outside.